Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of the world's biggest stars and some of my favourite people. And Tina Malone is one of them. How are you? I'm good, thanks, Alex. And um, thanks for having me here. No, it's my pleasure. So let's describe the picture then. Here I am sat at my desk talking to you and you've got a baby on your knee. Yes, actually, I've just got in from town. I've just been and had lunch with my husband and I'm sitting on my couch eating a packet of 12 with my gorgeous 11-week-old beautiful daughter, Flame, <laughs> lying asleep and just, well, actually, no, she's got one eye open, really. And uh, <clears throat> I'm still looking at her in absolute awe. All right, we're going to cover all of this, but I've got to start with your eating twirls. Now, you look delicious. How are you able to do that and lose weight? Well, to be honest, five years ago, I had the gastric balloon. Um, I'd got to 19 stone. I was seriously depressed, and I was eating like a pig. I was um, injecting insulin three times a day and on 38 tablets a day for everything from beta blockers to metformin, almodipine, lisinopril for anxiety and one thing and another and uh, coupled with the weight and, and you know the diabetes and the Cushing syndrome I'm now five years on um, well this time last year I was size 8 and down to 8 stone 2 from 19 stone 2 wow. and um, to be honest I've, I've had a gastric band it's well known I had the balloon lost 4 stone had the balloon taken out after six months in 2009 and then regained two stone as you do um because i'm ocd bipolar all those things i can't unfortunately alex moderate so uh i need something like a gastric band either that or cut me throat to stop me eating <laughs> um everything to excess so uh yeah i managed to get uh, in fact i only got up to 13 stone with flame during, uh, at the end of my pregnancy and I'm back down now to 11.2 so within the next two or three months I will be back down once I've had my band tightened again next week I will get down to size 8 again I've got great admiration for you I mean you're talking to a guy who's just lost four stone I like you have battled with weight my entire life what worries me about this though as, as is the case with you it, it's a life thing isn't it there's no such thing as a diet you've got to make it as part of your life you know what the problem is nowadays, and I could write a book, let alone my, my autobiography, I could write a book on diets, as probably you can. You can. I come from a, 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 you know, a heavily dominated group of women in my family, you know, the Irish Catholic, and my mum and her four sisters are all very beautiful women, and very lucky um, to be a slim and gorgeous. My mother's eight stone and size eight, and always has been, but they watch what they eat. And my mum has said all her life, moderate. Well, as with everything, whether it was smoking, drinking, work, sex, whatever, I can't moderate. It's not in my vocab. doesn't happen to me. So, hold me hands up. The only way you're going to control my eating was um, a gastric band or a gastric bypass. And I know that sounds drastic, but having tried everything from Slimming World and Weight Watchers and Light and Life and Lipo Trim, the Cambridge Diet, the Heart and Lung, the Banana, the Cabbage, blah, blah, blah. What you do realize is these diets do all work, but it's maintaining, it's not losing the weight, it's maintaining. Now, you've done it, obviously, the hard way, Alex, but what I would say with most people is, and I guarantee when you see these Slimmers of the Year who've lost, you know, maybe six stone, eight stone, ten stone, I guarantee if it's in your makeup, whether it's genetically or your psyche, to overeat, to overindulge with food, and you got to a place where you were that big, it will come back on you again the minute you have a traumatic situation or you're a comfort eater or whatever. So the gastric band is for life. I have kept it in during my pregnancy. I'm the first ever only what they call celebrity, although I hate that word, to do that, to be pregnant with IVF at 50 and keep the gastric band in. And it just got pushed up while the uterus expands as along with the liver and the kidneys, etc. Um, and it's worked for me. I mean, you know, I lost eight stone in the first eight months and over 24 months, I lost 11 stone. So it, it's simple as that. Again, I absolutely admire you for it. I mean, my whole day spent worrying about eating and worrying about not eating. Where are you at now with it? I mean, you can't physically, well, but you what still... This is, the, the, the simple answer is, and this, it's, it sounds that easy, but to eat 
it's, it, all these fads that we have, don't eat at night, is absolute scientific garbage. You are supposed to have your meal at whatever time. You are supposed to have supper. People say, oh, yeah, but I've, if you eat after six, it will stay on you. And look, I've lost five pounds in two weeks. It shows. That's absolute garbage. That's just because you cut down. Your body do, is not affected by the times you eat. The only reason they go on about breakfast is because it kickstarts your metabolism because it has been resting. But if you don't eat from six o'clock, your body almost goes into shock and goes, right, you're not going to eat between now and seven or eight in the morning, right? Mm. So therefore, your body goes into shock and doesn't work as hard. But that's why you still eat your tea, whether it's between six and eight, and then you eat at night whether it's 10 or 11 or 9 and you have supper whether it be toast or crackers or a pudding or whatever the key is this it's this simple Alex eat little and often so now I do eat spinach every day I do eat porridge every day I do have well I attempt to have an English breakfast at weekends because I love them I can't get them in so does the dog Excuse me, that's my <laughs> cocker. She hears someone walks past, she goes ballistic. Um, but, you know, it, it, it is that simple, little and often, and you can eat anything. When I say I'm sitting here now with Cadbury's chocolate buttons and a packet of twirls my husband's just given to me, and I eat a couple of them, and then I'm bursting. So I eat chocolate every day, Alex. You see, I was never a pie or a pasty girl. I'm a chocolate and cake girl. Yeah, same here. I, you know what? You'd have to shoot me to stop me eating chocolate. What's interesting about you, though, you've always been sexy and you've certainly never had a problem with sex. And I know for me, I'm ginger and deeply unattractive. So being fat as well, it couldn't be worse if I was German. You've never had that. No, honestly. So, Alex, no. Do you know what? It, it, it's a funny thing, isn't it, with women? You know, I you can laugh someone into bed, you know. <laughs> I played a fat, funny scouse bird for 20 years. I mean, I always remember reading Cary Grant biography years ago. And, you know, where it said he pretended to be somebody he wanted to be until he became that person. Right. My problem is I I was that fat and enormous. I knew how ugly I had become. But I'm. Uh, this isn't a facade or bravado or ball. This is the truth. I walk in, in a room and I'm astonished if all the men don't fancy me, even when I was a monster. <laughs> I just don't get it. So it was never, it never affected my confidence low self-esteem with things that have maybe happened in my life to me you know whether that be abandonment rejection failure insecurity or whatever low self-esteem is a very different thing than confidence mm. very different every job i go for i think they're i think they're insane if they don't take me um unless i'm not right and they're looking for a six foot eight stone blonde I was 25 years of age, but I am astonished when every man doesn't want me. I, I always have been. I don't, you know, when people say, oh, you're punching above your weight. Um, literally, God in heaven, I'd have had to be coming on to Robert De Niro to punch above <laughs> my weight. Nobody <laughs> is. And I think, you know what, that comes from having a wonderful father, a very stern, very strict father, but having a really wonderful father who said to me at a very young age, you know, good boys and bad boys like good girls. Hmm. So always keep your hand on your hate me. And I was always, I always knew from a kid I was never going to be anyone's for a bag of chips and half a lager. So, you know, I, I think far too, well, far too highly of myself, I guess, um, where men are concerned. But in saying that, um, you know, people keep telling me how ordinary I am. I don't think I'm anything special. And, you know, my daughter is very beautiful. My mother's very beautiful. Alex, you, you, you know, you've just said about yourself. Believe you me, love, I was hit with the ugly stick. It jumped a generation of beauty with me, but I got the brains and the personality. And being a woman, you can laugh people into bed. Do you know well, what I mean? You can and I have, but the trouble is once I've taken my clothes off, they're still laughing. That's the problem. <laughs> well, I, I no, but, a few laugh at me, love. Yeah, but Listen, seriously, though, I, what you've got it's how you use it I am fascinated though by that psychology that you could be so confident on the one hand and so insecure yeah. on another have you tried to sort of dig deep and work out how yeah. you can have had the issues you have and yeah. at the same time be so confident 
Well, yeah, because I had years of cognitive therapy, and I mean real cognitive therapy. I don't mean a counsellor who got a degree off the back of a cornflakes pack, you know, after three weeks training. I mean proper psychiatrist. I mean, I, I'm, I'll be honest with you, Alex. I'm odd. I've always been an odd person. I was an odd child. I loved being with loads of people. Then I loved being on my own. I used to open the door and lie to kids and go, I can't play out. My mum and dad won't let me. And my mum and dad go, we will. But I just used to go, shh. <laughs> I just didn't want to go out. I loved being with me. Mm. That's how it was. And the way I've always been. But, um, so let me ask this question like, then. Oh, might you love me or hate me? Um, there's no kind of in-between, really. But what's interesting about that then, I wonder whether you've got so much time with yourself that you're too almost intelligent and you're thinking too much, and that could lead to some of the neurosis that you've suffered. Do you think that could be possible? Totally agree with you. Um, I am typical Aquarian, genius bordering on madness. <laughs> um, I am opinionated, self-obsessed. Um, but I'm also a great listener and a great mentor. I appreciate beauty in all areas of life mm. and youth and vitality. That's why I love to teach and write. But um, I've never been the kind of bird that's, you know, bothered by a, a prettier girl next to me. Um, I know a lot of celebs are. I really, really don't care because if there's a 20-year-old beauty blonde on one side of me and a 30-year-old stunning brunette on the other... I think you're quite seriously insane if you don't want to spend your time with me. Um, <laughs> and if they've got something better, well, do you know what? Well done, girls. Good luck to you. Is this bravado, or do you really believe that? I mean, no, I seriously believe it. But I always have done. I mean, don't get me wrong, Alex. I was an angry, fat bird, defensive. And I do think when you're fat, it makes you angry. And I think it makes you quite ruthless. Um, I mean, the saddest thing about being a big fatty is when I see the big fatties now saying oh no I'm happy and I say you're a liar mm. um, is that I didn't go I'm a big fat bird and aren't I great I went I'm a big fat ugly bird but I know how everything else is wonderful about me that's what I'm saying mm. I didn't kind of go look at all my fat doesn't that make me sexy I just look like you'd have a good time with me whether we were talking or in the bedroom or the kitchen or wherever. So now when you look in the mirror and yeah. you've lost this huge, huge, huge amount of weight, what do you see? Um, well, that's a whole... Oh God, I could spend hours telling you that, Alex, I'll be honest with you. Um, it took me a while to get to grips with going into Harvey Nicks and being able to try a pair of Gucci or Prada pants on with a zip and a button at the side that was mm. size eight and I could get my fingers in. It took me a while to get to grips with that. What is funny is my, most of my friends say, you now think like a skinny bird. I actually do watch what I eat. I mean, you know, the gastric bands that I had done with the hospital group in this country and they're phenomenal. And I did research the clinics and what I liked about the hospital group was, Alex, their post care is brilliant. Mm. and uh, you have re regular checkups, and I don't mean because of who I am but you know the proof's in the pudding isn't it I didn't want to be one of those celebrities who kind of went well you know I've gone from a size 20 to a size 14 and then bailed it back on again you know um, I knew when I do something I knew from a size 28 I was going to get to an 8 or a 6 to the point where I was starting to look a bit ridiculous mm. too thin I mean I've never been a beauty I'm no oil painting you know what I mean uh, just the way it goes isn't it the way the cookie crumbles I'm but 5 foot 1 I'm never going to be tall and elegant that's just the way it is physically though I mean one of the things I've struggled with just losing 4 stone is the toll it takes on the body I mean are you a, a big mess under the clothes or, or how is it looking no do you know what I've got a big uh I've got a lot of skin around my stomach. I'm quite lucky in so much as, I mean, I don't think I look 51. Um, but um, my skin's good on my arms and my body. I'm quite lucky that way. I have quite greasy, oily skin, mm. which has benefited me in later life. Um, so no, I don't look horrendous. I've just got, I guess, a flap of skin, my stomach, but it's not kind of down to my knees. And, you know, inevitably, I lost the big boobs, so I've got, like, you know, my, my boobs at the moment are like golf balls in socks, you know, I could, people say they're like spaniel's ears, no, I could wrap round mine round the back of my neck, mm. but um, 
and I've got a big sexy younger husband and my God does he love me funny enough we just I've been walking through town I was, I'm looking at all these girls and going now she looks fab and he's like and he's not one of them fellas who looks to the floor he'll look with me and go well no yeah or whatever but so you've got to say to yourself then, Tina, and what fascinates me about this is is what's the point? What's the point of losing all that weight if he loved you big and he loves you slim? And even if you've because got a... now he doesn't need a JCB to carry throw me around the bedroom, that's why. <laughs> and also to prolong my life. And I want to be able to get in a bath with him and sit on him, not like have to hoist me out of it. <laughs> You know, so, did it ever uh, matter though in the beginning? I mean, did he care? Is this all about you? Because it sounds to me, I mean, he's. Oh my God! Of course, it's about me. He didn't care. I mean, he, you know, in so much as he's glad that I get wolf whistles more now, and that men go everywhere I go. Oh my God, you look incredible! Um, to the point where my cousin, our Carol, actually went to me. Who's always been a size ten? She went. It must have been incredible being as fat as you were to suddenly go from being huge and ugly to looking fantastic because so many more people comment on how you look. Mm. Um, and he's glad that men look at me and I can wear shorts and I can wear a bathing costume on the beach and stuff like that. Of course, he's glad. He'd be a liar if he wasn't. Um, and he does say, you know, I'm not a pizza eater but he'll say to me if my slice of cake's too big hey come on you know what I mean mm. but he loves me anyway and I mean I he knows how good I am in the living room in the kitchen and in the bedroom so he ain't going nowhere no lap dancer in the world's ever gonna run away with him he just you know what I've never pinned a man down because I always think they'll do what they're gonna do mm. but basically you know why would he chomp on a burger when he's got fillet steak at home <laughs> And I don't know about you, losing weight does make you feel sexier and therefore hornier and want yeah. to be more sexual. Yeah, well, um, to, uh, to be honest, I've always been like that. So it, it's not really, um, <laughs> that's not really ever been an issue with me. I've always been a three times a ge- day girl, Alex, although <laughs> I hasten to add, not at the moment. I beat him off with a big stick. In fact, I only said to him before, I've still got me big pregnancy now because if I wore them on my head, you'd still jump on me, wouldn't you? <laughs> he went, yeah. So uh, without being vile, but yeah, seriously. Um, and how easy is that to find? I mean, I guess you've spent your whole life looking for someone who loves you for being you. I mean, this guy sounds like an angel. You know what he is? Um, he's very laid back, Paul. I mean, he, don't get me wrong, he's a 32-inch waist and a 44-inch chest. You know, he's in the gym seven days a week. Um, and he's a ex-soldier, 10 years. He's seen things in Iraq and Afghan and Northern Ireland that, you know, me or you wouldn't want to see. But he brings, you know, a wealth of maturity in that way that I don't have to our relationship because I am irresponsible in a lot of ways, spending, <laughs> paying bills, God knows what else. I'm like a child. But like he always says, he sees the actor, Tina Malone, sees the teacher, sees the mentor, sees the auntie, the mother, the sister, and, you know, kind of uh, all those things that I am to people. But he gets the girl, you know, and, mm. um, and, and he's very much, he wears the pants. I'm no Jordan, you know, with little men running around fussing over me. Uh, he wears the pants as much as I do. I, you know, I'm an academic. I'm highly read and well-traveled. And he would be the first to stand here next to me and say, I am more educated than he is. Mm. But he has a completely different wealth of knowledge and maturity than I do. And it works. And you know what I always think? You know, the day... All us women go, those shoes were 40 quid when they were 400. You know, we just do. That's yeah. part of our genetic makeup, I think. Yeah. And he doesn't care and he doesn't get it. And, you know, my husband, you can give him 500 quid to go and spend on two pair of trainees and a pair of pants and he'll come back with 460 and go, I went to a top shop yeah. and look what I got. Um, he's not interested in kind of clothes jewellery and stuff like that whereas I am because being a big fat bird and only being able to shop in one shop for 20 years now means I can go in Harvey Nixon Selfridges and buy all the designers so I had a room full of bags and boots but now I've got like hence the bankruptcy two years ago mm. um, but that's been cared because obviously I've been pregnant in the last nine months and now have a almost three month old she t- I wish you could see her Alex she's lying here on my knee in a little cow outfit with little cow bluebells on her feet <laughs> and little pink ears on her hands and she is the most mm, 
beautiful thing. Show business people generally don't like ugly fat people, in your own words, and yeah. they also don't like people with big personalities because they outshine them. So how did showbiz, particularly the women in show business, um, deal with Tina Malone? Well, women, you see, the, the, with being a big fat bird, <laughs> women never found me a threat. I'm sorry, I'm not laughing. It's just funny the way you say that, but c- carry on. Women, but it's the truth. Women don't... F- I had friends, actresses who were beautiful or ugly or all shapes and sizes and all ages because when women stand next to a big fat bird, it makes them look even more attractive. So I was never a threat to them, or so they thought. Mm. And men like me because they know... They think, well, you're so fat, you're not going to come on to me. So you wouldn't have to cheek how wrong they are. And then then they end up falling in love with me and going, Jesus Christ, I would never have fancied you if I walked in a room. But my God, now I'd rather have you than any other bird in here. And, you know, that's always worked as well. So, you know, in terms of showbiz, I think, you know, when I was starting out as an actress, I looked at the television, who earned the most money? Pauline Quirk, Caroline Quentin, mm. Dawn French, Joe Brand. And I thought, these are all big bits. So my father always says, you eat more and more and more because in showbiz you can be anything you want. And, you know, as much as we bang on about, you know, anyone from the Kardashians and, and you know, all these these weight, to, you know, to Nicole Richie, to Jordan, to Cheryl Cole, all the weight disorders, I also think, you know, when you hear these, even our local kind of talent, you know, the Martin McCrutchens, the Michelle Heatons, all kind of going through one food disorder and another, I think it's more their insecurity about the magazines and about everything. You see, I personally don't care if you take a picture of me tomorrow sitting in a cafe with a big cream bun hanging out my mouth with the cream all up my nose and everything. If I'm enjoying it, I don't give a toss, right? I actually really don't care what photos you take of me. I'm not interested. But can't you see you're not playing that game, though? I mean, they're playing a game of being hot, and the trouble with age and show business is they get no, bored very you know quickly. What? I've always been the same, whether I'm whatever age. Mm. And I don't mean giving up, because I love nothing more now than dressing up. And we're big boxing fans, me and my husband. We go to all the fights. Um, you know, I'm friends with Frank Warren, and we get a lot of, you know, whether it's kind of Eubank or the Smiths or, mm. you know, uh, Carl Zaki or, you know, Ricky Hatton. We go a lot of the fights, and I'm ringside. And I love the fact that, you know, of 20,000 men there and only 1,000 women, that all the men are going, oh, my God, you look at me. I love it. Yeah, of course yeah, yeah. I love attention. But if someone shouted, you fat, but, you know, I'm not interested. I really, seriously, unless he's sleeping with me or paying me mortgage, I don't care. Have you had that where people have been deliberately rude? I don't think anybody would dare to be honest. I mean, people <laughs> keep saying to me, don't they? She says that she puts another chocolate button in her mouth. <laughs> people keep saying to me, you know, about the whole IVF thing. Well, aren't you worried about the negativity? Or and I go, what negativity? I'm not aware of any. I mean. Mm. I, and I'm seriously not blinkered. I mean, I'm one of them women who can have a conversation with three people in a room and hear what's going on over there. Right. I'm nosy. I'm, I'm, I got slim for my health to have a baby, to wear knickers and bras in the bedroom with the lights on, and to look sexy and for my health and to live longer mm-hmm. and to have IVF, right? Because my doctor went, who ate all the pies? And you've got no chance of getting an IVF whether you pay for it or mortgage your house for it the size you are. No doctor in his right mind's going to give you IVF. So I got myself ready. I mean, you know what? I don't criticize anyone. I don't care what anyone else does. Um, I can celebrate, you know, beauty, whether it's Charlie Searon or Cheryl Cole, two very beautiful, talented women. But you said earlier about young girls. I mean, what do you think the impact compared to somebody like you as a big personality who doesn't care or somebody like the Cheryl Coles who is so stick thin or even Victoria Beckham, who's probably a better example. I don't know a guy in this world who finds her attractive because she's so thin. I don't know a woman really who finds her attractive, but you know, I kind of think you can be thin and attractive and sexy because Kate Moss is a person perfect example of that. I seriously believe she doesn't care what people think. Victoria Beckham's a whole different kettle of fish. I mean, isn't she? I mean, you know, she's a wonderful mother, designer, and all those things. But I guess if you haven't got one particular 
particular wonderful talent you will play around with lots of others mm. um, and you know so uh, you know that she's been lucky in so much as she's created a fortune and got beautiful healthy children but would I want to be in now and people say why doesn't she smile I mean <laughs> I think it's fairly obvious why she doesn't um, you know I've always rather been why, why is that then why do you think she can't smile <laughs> because there's a certain sense of achievement that comes with being in our business that you want to attain. Otherwise, why, when you've made your 50 million, don't you bugger off to an island somewhere and just have your kids? No, mm. you want that constant adoration. But if people go to you, well, hang on, you're not one of the best designers in the world. You're not one of the best dancers, one of the best singers, one of the best blah, 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 right? You're always going to feel kind of insecure if that's what you wanted to achieve so you think despite all her success and the david beckham husband there's still an insecurity there of course there is my god she smacks of it of course there is otherwise why is she plucked in makeup with high heels on every day while taking the kids out come on so if you had the chance to be tina malone or victoria beckham you'd rather be you Oh, my God, the only thing I would want of Victoria Beckham's are four beautiful, healthy children mm. and a bank balance. That's it. <laughs> Seriously, wouldn't want David. You joke, and he'd spend longer in the bathroom than me. <laughs> it's a bit much, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? So good luck to her, and I've got nothing against her, but it's not for me. I've, I've, listen, I'd rather be Judy Dench with 10 million than Jordan mm. with, fifth, with 100 million. And, you know, I'd rather be talented and acclaimed and celebrated um, you know that's just the way it is do you know what I mean I, uh, you know it, of course I'm like everybody else I want success I want money do I want fame no I don't care about fame that's why people say are oh, you really known for being ordinary and accessible yeah I am accessible do you know why my dad God rest his soul said to me years ago 10 years ago you know what you're no different whoever you are whatever you've got you're going in the same hole mm. you poo the same and you eat the same yeah. whatever you've got or you haven't got so no one's any better whatever you achieve is brilliant and you should be proud but never think you're better than anyone else any colour, any race, any creed, because you're not. The irony is that actually desperately deep-rooted insecurities in them. I am seriously not insecure. I would love that chat show. I would love a late-night chat show that talked to, you know, Jeremy Hunt, that got Portillo on, mm. that got Cheryl Cole on, that, you know, the diversity of people and the knowledge I have that I could talk to, it would be second to none because I wouldn't take any prisoners. I wouldn't be sat on a stage with Meg Ryan going, oh my God, she's bored me to death. What am I going to do? Mm. I'd get out of any situation. But then when you've had to most of your life, I guess you can there is a sort of Illuminati sort of running the media, isn't there? As such, I hate that word, the media, because it doesn't really exist. There's always going to be Masons, Illuminati, you know, the Oxbridge set. Mm. But you know what you have to do, like Jimmy Morville did when he went to Cambridge from, mm. you know, Walton in Liverpool. You have to break that mould. And you know, when I left Brookside 18 years ago and said, I want to go to the RSC and the National Theatre, mm. and everyone went, <laughs> you're... Um, Early 30s, soap star, fat, Liverpool accent, no degree, never been to drama school. I don't think it's going to happen. And it did. I did 10 months at the National with rave reviews. OK, the RSC haven't knocked on my door yet to play Mother Courage or Lady Macbeth. Let's hope one day they have the sense to do that. Mm. But in the meantime, it's their loss. Um, you know, I, I do think my ability as an actor is is you know i've got a lot of ability i know my limitations as well i also know that i appeal to all women highbrow and the ordinary woman on the street because i am very real and i have an opinion on body image weight issues drink and drugs crime teenagers and particularly i love teaching kids um and on IBF and the and the postcode lottery that we have, whether the Tories and whatever else, and I'm politically very aware as well. Don't get me on politics, but um, you know, do I think I've got a lot to say? Yeah. And if you don't like it, like I say to people, we'll turn off and don't listen to me. This is fascinating. We're here with Tina Malone. A new book is in your stores now, by the way. We should remind people it is as fascinating as the lady herself. I mean, something like Loose Women could give you a platform. Would you go on that? 
Um, yeah, I mean, a mate of mine, uh, Sharon, uh, is the executive producer, and I've done Loose Women, funnily enough, um, probably about eight times over the last four or five years. Strangely enough, I only bumped into Andrea McLean and Sherry Hewson last Friday when I was doing this morning, and I said, do you know I've not been on your show for over 12 months since I've had my IVF and since I've had my baby? And they were like, you're joking? I said, no. You think I'm here all the time? I haven't been on for over 12 months. Mm. As a guest, I was on eight times. As a, one of the panel, um, I don't know. Um, I just wouldn't prefer my own. Are you too much, though? I mean, do they want this level of honesty and this level of realness? Because the one thing about that I've learned about executives in TV and radio is, is they like you to be real under their impression of real, but not too real that you make people nervous. And you do, don't you? Because you, you tell it as it is. Well, you know what, though? Sometimes they'll celebrate that. And when you break the bar, maybe it's taken me, you know, I've been on the precipice since I was 40 of, you know, national fame. And and what what does come with this kind of fame tag is the ability to talk to execs and producers in the way I do now, as in more collaboration than telling Mm. me what to say and do. Um, You know, I was in Paul Abbott's, who's a genius from clocking off and state of play to Seamus. And I work for a company run by George Faber. Very um, wonderful, incredible producers who've done everything from, you know, discovering Daniel Craig and Christopher Eccleston in Our Friends in the North years ago, right up to Shameless. Mm. And I'm working alongside incredible actors and a great crew in Manchester for nine years. And I'm blessed to have played Mimi because, you know, those parts go to Robert Carlyle, Ray Winston and De Niro. They don't go to women. Mm. But... um, do I think there's life in me yet? Do I think I will continue? My God, Alex, I'm only just beginning. I mm. want my own series. I want to be the female Ross Kemp stroke Louis Theroux. I want to be the British Oprah Winfrey. I want to be, I want to do dramas. I'm obsessed with Downton Abbey. I'd love to do Corrie or Emmerdale. Uh, my daughter's on tour at the moment in 51 Shades of Maggie. She went to university drama school. I struggled to educate her and she's now a, an incredibly talented wonderful actress got a beautiful fiance gets married next year big wedding in the lakes and has done everything right mm. i didn't but hey how you pick yourself up and get on with life but she's done everything sensibly she's 32 beautiful talented funny charming and clever and all that's brilliant and you know i've got a load of family who are supportive of me and the baby and what's going on now but you know what I'm one of those Alex you know if I'm sitting up tonight and it's three in the morning and the baby's asleep and the cleaner's been Mm. and I've walked the dogs me cocker bella and me teacup yorkie bob and Paul's in bed asleep I'll start cooking a lemon drizzle cake and think do you know what I'm going to try a crunchy topping actually I'm going to make a new kind of carbonara with black treacle you could start a conference with your mind couldn't you really Oh God! Yeah. Do you know what? I, I can be. I do bore myself. That that's why I think I like to be on my own because it, it, it's like if people say you've got an opinion on everything. You know what? If you ask me to do a documentary on cricket or rugby, I haven't got a clue. I right. wouldn't know where to begin. So certain things you play to your strengths. Eating, yeah, I have an opinion of stuff that I know about, stuff that I'm interested in, and I can appreciate qualities in other people that well qualities other people have that I don't have I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm not good at and I'll shout it from the rooftops because I'll have to and I've always had to I've always felt in life people are either sort of radiators or drains they either give over warmth or they suck the life out of you and and you right now are in a place where you're clearly optimistic and everything's great just going back to the book which is in stores now I mean the first story we get to is, is a beautiful childhood but then a pregnancy and a baby taken away do you think this positivity comes out of the adversity that you've fought well, you know what? I get, you know, I kept my daughter. I mean, she was taken away from me at five days and spent six weeks in hospital. And I asked my parents, could I keep her? And my dad said, no, if you do, you have to leave this house. And so I left that house and went to live with my auntie miles away because I wanted to keep my baby, um, which shows that I was immature enough and not strong enough to disagree about going into the Catholic nursing home for bad mothers miles away. But when it came push to shove and I really wanted my baby, 
I was prepared to walk out of a house and a home with everything to nothing. So, you know, um, I kind of think, but you know what though, Alex, you go, people go, oh God, you're an incredible woman and you're inspirational and I've become the, you know, the Betty Grable, those of you who know she is, Cheryl Cole, shall we say, of uh, Poster Girl of IVF. But, you know what, I was pregnant at 17, pregnant at 50. I don't do things by arms, as my mother said. Mm. Um, and it's not for attention, it's just the way it is. Um, Have you ever forgiven your father? I mean, I don't know how yes, you would I get did. over it. My God, yeah, I did. I forgave him How? Months later. Because you know what? You have to forgive. I lost my dad 11 years ago. I've still never got over it. He was an incredible man and could be quite cruel and quite strict. Um, but that's the nature of the beast. You know, the older you get, the wiser you become, the more accepting you become as a person. And I am much more accepting now. And and But don't get me wrong, Alex. I'm still ruthless and cutting edge and cutting, and I'll cut your throat if you have me off or you harm me. Do you yeah. know what I mean? If you yeah. don't like me, that's fine. Right. But don't harm me or mine because I'll have you bad. I'll string you up and I mm. am very much like that. Are there similarities between Mimi? I mean, I've interviewed a lot of people in Coronation Street and it seems to me they morph into each other in the end. You can't do that job for that long. Um, I, I mean, how much was Mimi, how much was you in Shameless? Well, you know what? Mimi was scouse and fat like me, scouse, fat, defensive and angry like me. But that's probably where it ends. I wouldn't wear her clothes. I wouldn't wear her hair. Um, but she loved I, her family I, and would fight for them. That that was the moral I got from Shane. Yes, yeah, but she had a very strange set of principles mm. and morals, you know. We're both Liverpool fans and we're both Catholic as well. Right. But I would say that's the end of it. You know, I'm more kind of, you're going to catch me. Mimi's more news of the world and a sausage butty with brown sauce. <laughs> I'm much more the observer and a croissant and, you know, the latest blueberry juice, believe it or not. <laughs> and I guess it's a testament to my ability as an actor yeah. that people think I grew up on a council estate. Mm. Um, and I didn't. I came from a very mixed background. My mum was very poor working class um, with three very, you know, hard brothers. And my dad was from quite a middle class Irish French family. So, you know, I had a really strange upbringing. You know, my father was teaching me about politics and, you know, wanted me to be able to say hello and come in and sit down and welcome in everything mm. from Russian and Romanian to French and Spanish. Whereas my mother just looked me to, wanted me to look good in my coat on a Sunday in the parlour for mass. So, you know, um, it was very strange, very odd um, upbringing. But um, I've lived in a flat, in a bed sit with a kid and a Staffordshire Bull Terrier and a hamsters and a lucky meter. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I've done it both ways. I've been both ends of the scale. Mm. And I guess that's how I appreciate. And I've been with all kinds of different men. Believe you me, there's not one type I haven't had. Uh, what have you learned in life about that? Is numbers better than uh, sort of sticking with the same one that's not very good? Because, I mean, the one thing you do have is experience, isn't it? No, I can't bear men who threat with loads of women or been with loads of women. Oh, my God, it's the most dis it's the most distasteful it's like meeting a man who fancies himself there's nothing worse um, I just think uh, experience comes from knowledge and you know what you can experience different people at different ages and, and a wealth of knowledge can come I can usually Alex to be honest with you read people whether they're 15, 20, 25, 35 up to 85 I can read people like a book mm. where I am very clever is I'm incredibly perceptive and also I can be with anyone from all different walks of life and people go to me my god I've just opened up my life story to you where do you get the ability from but I also have the ability to make people feel good and I'm very honest I don't jerk them off I'm very honest mm. because as a teacher I tell people constantly accentuate the positive and work on your negatives yeah. You know, and that's what I've had to do all my life. You've mentioned Cheryl Cole many times. Do you pity people like that that have this sort of mega fame and lots of money? I mean, you've struggled to get where you are. You've had ups and downs. It's been tough and it's brought you to a place now where you've found true happiness. What, 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 um, what have you I learned? I her as an example because, you know, she can sing, she can dance. I mean, she's incredibly beautiful. She can't and sing well, though, can she? Nobody ever says Cheryl Cole's the best singer and, and you mentioned well, earlier. Yeah, but, you know, 
Leona Lewis ain't ever going to be Barbara Streisand, you know? <laughs> you know, it's simple as that, isn't it? You know, that's, if we if we look at all, you know, the iconic people in our life, you know, and, uh, you know, whether I'm looking at Stevie Wonder and George Michael, who are geniuses, you know, right down to, you know, George Michael's probably one of the most fashionable or pro- mind you know god if i was saying george michael to a 20 year old they'd go who oh, wouldn't they yeah, yeah. but um so you know um i think i i say cheryl because kids and, and all women of all ages can associate with her um do i pity her now i think she's kind of fine um I, and and you know she's got talent and good people around her and also i've met her a couple of times and she's a genuinely lovely girl i think the problem with huge celebs like that is, uh, you know, a lot of the time it's the people they surround themselves with. You say, I'm, you know, who was it the other day said they saw Jay-Z walking through Manchester City Centre on his own? And I just think, when you hear him interviewed, how intelligent he is. And then you get some tosser, like, well, I won't mention a certain actor, who walks around with an entourage of six people, and you think, well, yeah, probably someone is going to punch you in the face. But, um, you know, you get a grip. Um, You know, you're only as important, really, as, you know, you make yourself out to be. And if you crave that kind of adoration or attention with no backing and no depth to what you do, whether you write, Mm -hmm. sing, direct, whatever, well, then... You know, people are entitled to have their opinions. I mean, you know, like I've said, Alex, I'm like Marmite, love me or hate me. Is Um, fame destructive, do you think? I mean, I think of Justin Bieber, almost what you've just described, that you can be surrounded by so many people who are blowing smoke up your arse, you don't know which sort of end of the toilet to to flush down. The perfect example of it is Michael Jackson, isn't it? No one in the world had ever said no to him. Mm-hmm. And yet he had a very complicated upbringing. And I got to know Latoya quite well. Um, and they had a crazy upbringing. But, you know, nobody during his childhood and later years ever, ever, ever said no to him. So there's a product of uh, absolute mega stardom. How sad, how tragic him, Marvin Gaye, Whitney Houston, you know, tragic endings but I mean you mentioned George Michael earlier it does seem a pattern that to be really good at what you want to do in show business you've got to be a bit screwed up well yeah gee will you have let's be honest why do I do I want to walk on a stage do something that's going to make me sweat have palpitations have high anxiety learn work on my feet just for a group of people to go yeah that was really good and clap me for two minutes Mm. Can you still be hurt? If I give you a bad review now, can you still be hurt? No, not in the slightest. What, 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 what's the worst you're going to say? Tina Malone's a big, fat, mouthy, scouse, militant cow who doesn't shut up and loves the sound of her own voice. And I'd go, mm, that's pretty much right. <laughs> so I don't kind of see that as a negative. What else? I think we'll say? use that as a headline of this interview. How about that? <laughs> hey, listen, I'm going to let as you go. Be- if you never call me a Tory, we'll be like, we'll be all right. You can call me anything you want. We didn't even get on to politics. Listen, Tina Malone, I love you very much. I want to meet you properly and do this again because it's been so much fun and fascinating. Again, I didn't get to half the things that I wanted to talk to you about. Aww. Thank you, Alex. Very finally about the politics that you have mentioned a couple of times. Where are we at in Britain? Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? I think it's a big charade. I think we're shrouded in candy floss and garbage. I think it's getting worse. I think globally things are getting worse. The only thing we have intact is human nature, the kindness of human nature. And we only ever see that when there's a tsunami or quite recently the the tragedies in the Philippines um, and, and, you know, Syria. And it's heartbreaking. And being a mother again, it's absolutely heartbreaking. You know, when people go to me, you've had it hard. My book, Back in Control, is a good read. It's funny, it's sad, it's tragic, but you know what? I go, look at those people with those floods in Somerset, three or four times over with families, old people can't get out, and look at those kids in Syria, maimed, starving, orphaned. You know what? I've had it easy. Mm. If you got your own chat show and you had David Cameron on, what would be your first question? Um, Probably... Are you arresting me, officer? Because I'd have punched him. <laughs> um, oh my God, that's too big. A, uh, too big. A, I'd like to do Cameron and Tony Blair. Um, and do you know what show I've always wanted to be on, Alex? Mm. 
and I've never been asked the Andrew Moore chef. <laughs> yep. And, uh, yeah, you know, people say, who would you like for dinner? I'd like Jay-Z and Andrew Moore. I'd like the most peculiar people. Yeah. But, um, the most yeah, interesting. I, I, I love my politics, but, um, you know, I guess uh, someone called me. I was on Sky TV the other week saying, talking about IVF. And I was talking about, you know, the, the, the lottery depending on the demographic of where you live, whether mm. you can get IVF on the NHS at 36, 39 or 42 across this country, which is absolutely disgraceful. It's like going from one city to another and saying, well, if you murder somebody in Manchester, you get three years, in Liverpool, eight years, mm. in Glasgow, 20 years. I mean, you know, where's, where's the kind of general consensus or legislation that has the same rules up and down the country doesn't work um, and what I what I feel about that is uh, that you know I, people are women are much more educated making better choices making later choices much more successful in the co up the corporate ladder producing directing right through to banking to whatever job now nurses doctors and so they're choosing later in life to have their children. So why are they penalised when you've paid into a system all those years? It's an absolute disgrace. I was told years ago that um, nowhere is it written in the great libraries of Paris, Milan or London that life is fair. And it seems in 2014 it's getting worse. I mean, life is just not yeah. fair. Well, you know what? We're still from the throwbacks of 30 years of Thatcher. People are still drugged up and fighting in the ghettos, which is what she wanted, because while we fight amongst ourselves, we're too apathetic to have, ever have any sort of a, a revolution, albeit a peaceful one. Mm. To You know what? In this country, if you rob the state because maybe you're slow or illiterate and you rob the state of a tenner a week because you're moonlighting, doing a bit of window cleaning, you'll be thrown in court, thrown in jail. You rob the country of 750 million through your incompetence with shares and banking and God knows what else, you'll get a three million pound payoff and sent to a big house in the country. Yeah. You know what I mean? We don't look after our poor. We don't look after our uneducated. We don't look, to, look after teens. Why are we the only country in Europe that has the biggest rate of teenage pregnancy? It's cool to be thick. Oh, my God, if I was Home Secretary, I'd tell you what, I'd sort this country out. What What do you recommend? What is going to sort this out? I mean, is it going to be First some... The thing I would do if I were Home Secretary would give milk back to every child in this country that Thatcher took off. Mm. I would also legalise every drug, which I know is contentious of me, but every single drug in the world, I would immediately legalise them. Including all. crack cocaine? Every single drug, everything, crystal meth, crack cocaine, I would legalise everything because then you take away the titillation and the naughtiness that makes teenagers, leads them to a life of sheer hell on that garbage because it's no longer attractive. And then I would plough money into the NHS into the cognitive therapy therapy and mental health institutions to get people help who need it with mental health problems and get rid of the stigma because people have such terrible lives that they've come from and we carry on with that circle of hate and pain and poverty. You talk party politically about Thatcher and Cameron and stuff like that. I, I do wonder, though, at the same time, we're talking about Blair and what he did to the bank, so I can't vote for Labour and I can't vote for Conservative. Who well, do we vote you know for? What? I, I also believe Blair took us into a war that we didn't need or warrant it, you know, so I have my feelings there as well. Who do I vote for then? Well, for me, I'm a Labour through and through because I can't get over that Thatcher destroyed the trade unions, mm. destroyed the steelworks, the miners, the ships. But they were responsible for the war and deregulating the banks, weren't they? Yeah, well, you know what? I just kind of think what she did in the 80s to this country, we're still paying back for. You know what? It's better the devil you know. I know all that stuff, and that's mm. how I kind of think. You know, going back to Labour, I'm Labour through and through. I'm working class. Well, well, most of us, because we work for a living, you know, but um, I, I, I wouldn't vote toward it. You'd have to, you'd have to stick pins in my eyes and saw me head off um, to vote Conservative. That's the God honest truth. You know, about 10 minutes ago, I said that was my last question and we've done another 10 minutes. I better not do this again. You've got a baby to feed and look after. Tina Malone, I have loved talking to you. It's been my honour and pleasure. Please come on again and uh, let's oh, meet and have a coffee. Thank you, Alex.
You're a Thank star. Thank you for having me and go out and buy my book. <laughs> well, listen, if you thought this was interesting, the book is even better. Uh, you get to read it from day one uh, through until today. It is fascinating. What a life, what a lady. Tina Malone's new book is out now. Thank you so much for coming on the programme. Thanks very much for having me, Alex. Lovely talking to you, love.